Um, and we are so, so, so delighted to have Gregory here with us today because he quite literally <laughs> has written the book on this topic area. So as you can see, it's on his first slide, uh, risk intelligence, how artificial intelligence can transform risk management. So we decided, look, if, if somebody can be bothered to write a book on this, we certainly want to hear from him and his perspectives with regards to how is digital innovation transforming this wonderful world of risk management. Um, now, Gregory, rather than me make an absolute hash of introducing you properly, perhaps if I pass across to yourself, um, firstly, invite everybody to give you a round of applause from their side of their muted microphones. And I'm sure, I'm sure Jane is certainly giving you a round of applause right now, if not everybody else. So giving you a round of applause to say thank you very much for coming and joining us today. And Gregory, if you'd like to introduce yourself um, and then get cracking over to you, Gregory. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yes, my name's Gregory Carroll. Uh, I've been working in the combined fields of uh, artificial intelligence and risk management for over 20 years, I guess. So I started long before it became um, common as it is today. Uh, my background isn't in finance and banking, which is where most people have come from in this, but um, more in what I refer to as mission critical business, which is defense, um, infectious disease, mining, and um, um, yeah, uh, key areas like that. Uh, the book I've written is uh, looks at risk from each of the different risk domains and proposes uh, different uh, technologies or uh, techniques for moving risk from uh, what I refer to as risk administration into being a proactive tool to actually assist in managing risk, um, which I'll get to shortly. Um, why isn't this clicking on? There we go. Okay, uh, so let me just talk about AI in the first instance. Uh, and although I'm referring to AI uh, in both the book and in these slides, I'm referring to a whole um, package of uh, modern technologies, which includes uh, blockchain and uh, uh, via um, uh, virtual reality and a few others. But at, all at their heart, they have uh, some uh, artificial intelligence uh, processing underneath them. Uh, starting off with the first thing, which again, most of you people I don't need to tell you, but um, uh, I'm looking at it from a corporate risk point of view, not a, from a occupational health and safety point of view. So from uh, my perspective, risk is not a, a good or a bad thing. It's just something you need to uh, um, understand um, and manage. Now, AI fits into that fairly well, but AI is a mathematical approach. So um, we need to actually look at risk from a mathematical uh, components, uh, which takes us into the whole quantitative area, uh, as opposed to what generally today is a very subjective view of risk with risk matrices, uh, matrices and um, subjective assessments of what risk is, um, which basically proves to be useless when you get to actually using it to actually change anything. Um, AI has been overhyped um, and uh, the, one of the big areas I'll, I'll cover shortly is that I'm known as what's uh, referred to as a Bayesian. Uh, and in the area of statistics, there's a Bayesian or probabilistic uh, statistics, and then there's uh, frequentist. Now, most of the um, uh, quantitative uh, risk uh, analytics have been on, a, on the frequentist side in the past. And that comes to, back to a real basic problem in the fact that um, your, your traditional machine learning models and um, uh, techniques actually have a way of uh, being assessed. And that method of assessment is known as they look at the precision of the models. When you actually think about it, um, risk being uncertainty can't be precise. So measuring it using a precision algorithm or precision uh, metric um, is incongruous. Whereas Bayesian is looking at a range of possibilities and what the probability of something fitting into that range being. So it's a lot more practical from a, a real point of view. And I'll cover a few more areas about that. <coughs> the 
The second thing about that is the traditional machine learning approach requires taking a lot of historical information and basing future decisions on that historical data. So they use the historical data to train their models. And then based on that training, they then make future predictions. Um, COVID has basically turned nearly everything in the world on its head. And therefore a lot of the historical data that people will be using will not be applicable to what future decisions and future actions will be. Um, another reason, whereas the Bayesian um, method or approach takes a subject matter's expertise and then adds current evidence to come up with what the new situation is um, on that. Uh, <coughs> then finally, what I want to talk about is the overarching thing about people looking at artificial intelligence is as a, as a replacement to human intelligence. I doubt whether that will ever happen. Um, I don't believe it's where it should be. And if it fails as a uh, technique in the future, it will be because it's gone down that path. I really prefer to refer to um, AI as augmented intelligence. Its purpose is to provide insight to humans to make better decisions and to understand more of the point, to understand the complexity in which they're operating. Um, now, talking about risk, how do we apply AI to risk? As I mentioned earlier, that AI is a mathematical approach and therefore we need to look at a, an environment which is mathematically explainable and alterable. Um, now, using the standard ISO 31000, definition of um, risk being the uncertainty of objectives. Although it kind of explains what risk is, it's not helpful from an actual solution point of view. Um, so I prefer to look at the concept of uncertainty being the variance in outcomes. And now, once you start looking at that, if you're talking about the variance, you can actually look at how you're gonna manage that variance. And that then gives you an opportunity to introduce uh, something like a AI. <clears throat> now, to come up with a variance, basically the key thing there is to deal with risk events. So instead of risk registers and um, risk um, uh, consequences and some things like that, what we really want to do is start with uh, an outcome, which obviously we have because that's why we're in business, and then work back from that to work out how that outcome came about. So. Traditionally, people have heard about scenario analysis and they've heard it through financial modeling. But what they do in financial modeling isn't really scenario analysis. It's purely what if um, and, um, uh, you know, analysis on, on the outcome. So they say, you know, what if the outcome goes up by 10% or down by 10%? That's not scenario analysis. Scenario analysis is looking at the path of how it got to that outcome. Um, so what you do is you go back to the basics and say, okay, starting from the outcome, how did that outcome or how is this outcome likely to come about? And from that, we move back to what the current state is. Now, in between the current state and our uh, uh, predicted outcome or the wished outcome, um, there will be a number of things that are going to affect it along the track. So we end up with a path and the path is multiple um, branches and ways of getting to the end. And depending on the options taken all the way through those different paths and what we refer to as nodes, you can come up with a range of possibilities on that outcome. Now, once you get to that point, um, you can say what affects each of those nodes. And I refer to those nodes um, or the things that affect us at each node as risk drivers. So different um, forces, let's call them forces, within the environment, whether they be behavioral or whether they be climatic or whether they be um, uh, competitor actions, they're all gonna actually create a, a, a effect on um, a decision or a point throughout that path um, that will affect it. Now, what we wanna be able to do, and this is where um, AI comes in. If we can actually um, 
model those effects on each of those points and then combine those effects, which we can through Bayesian mathematics, through each of the different steps, we can actually project what the outcome will be. And more than that, what it allows us to do is if we can monitor those drivers through KRIs and other type of metrics um, in real time, we have the facility to actually alter those effects on those drivers in real time, just like they do in manufacturing systems. Um, now we can do that in processing systems as well. So by affecting uh, what's coming in or what's affecting us, as it's affecting us, we get the opportunity to actually change the outcome and not just look at it as a, uh, a consequence of the risk. So once we get to that point, we are actually in true risk management. We're managing the risk as it's occurring. <coughs> um, now, the time I've got today is just too, too short to go through all the possibilities. Uh, so obviously have a look at my book. But uh, my book is structured, as I mentioned earlier on, into what I refer to as risk domains and his five of the seven domains. I, for the purpose of this talk, I'm not looking at um, security, which is cybersecurity um, or financial risk because they've pretty well covered it elsewhere. But um, here's a, just a list of different uh, risk collateral um, functions that uh, uh, as risk managers we have to carry out and the different types of AI technologies that are actually out there today. So I'm not talking about what might be possible. I'm saying what you can do today. And a lot of this you can do without technical knowledge. There are um, a vast range of um, cloud services available, especially from the major four, which is Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and IBM. Um, they are producing services that don't require um, programming or um, technical expertise to be able to put together. Um, and they cover most of these areas. Um, but as you can see, there's a fair bit of um, areas we can actually modify. So what I've gone through, <coughs> sorry, for today is to highlight what I consider the 10 top options, of which I think nine of them you can implement today. Uh, the probabilistic modeling, which is what I was talking about earlier, is the method of using uh, Bayesian mathematics. So, and that allows us to use uh, Monte Carlo simulations on each of those risk drivers. So if we can identify um, the risk events that are gonna occur, how they come about, look at the drivers at each of the steps along the way, we can then model each of those drivers using Bayesian mathematics. And it will then combine uh, the effects of each of those drivers through each of the steps, and then in the end produce uh, an overall effect to the outcome. So that basically is a fairly straightforward and fairly simple approach. Um, and the beauty about it, as I mentioned earlier on, is it uses basically um, subject matter expertise as the starting point. You don't need a huge range of uh, uh, historical data to train those models. Um, there's a lot of arguments about that, but um, we we'll, might handle that later on in the question and answer sessions. The second main thing is uh, knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs, I think, are the, one of the biggest benefits you can get today. Again, they don't require programming or anything else. Now, a knowledge graph <coughs> um, is the output of a knowledge database. And a knowledge data database is the collection of data from a, a standard operating database. So your normal uh, relational databases that you have all your um, um, you know, production information and sales going into. But it can then combine it with uh, documents such as invoices, uh, um, defects notices, uh, correspondence, you name it. All of that can go into the knowledge graph. And what it does is it identifies the entities that are being um, involved. And more than importantly, it works on their relationships. It works out how different entities affect other entities. So that's how processes affect processes or people affect processes. And uh, it's all done 
automatically using different AI technologies under the cover. You don't know, need to know how it does it. Um, in the end, it will give you maps and you, more to the point that you can actually um, put in queries to say um, things like, where are my vulnerabilities? Where are the points of greatest stress? Um, where's the most likelihood point of failure? They're all standard things you can do out of knowledge, knowledge graphs. Uh, neural networks, well, that's what most people probably listening today were expecting me to talk about. Uh, that's our traditional machine learning. Um, talking, saying earlier on that I'm a Bayesian and I'm not a, a fan of machine learning. That's in what's normally referred to as regression um, learning, which is looking at statistical values. Where um, machine learning is really powerful is when we start looking at um, other information such as vision. Um, and the general topic is referred to as classification. So you can put in a whole range of different risk drivers and a, a neural network will tell you um, how that will affect different uh, risk profiles. So you can use a lot of the information you've developed over the years that's sitting in your risk registers and actually start getting real um, objective analysis of that information about your business. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier on, a lot of this you can do without hiring a whole team of data um, scientists and programmers and all that. Um, for example, again, most of the major suppliers provide um, uh, uh, tools, which is generally referred to as AutoML, which is allows you to drag and drop all the pieces into a workflow that will actually carry out um, the equivalent of a full model structured uh, building. Now, the beauty, the beautiful thing about that is the end result of those auto ML is actually a deployable um, link that you can then in integrate with your existing um, applications. So it's one thing to actually build your models. It's another thing to actually get them used in your organization. I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, big data. <coughs> One of my big things about risk is the concept of context. Again, ISO and uh, COSO both um, refer to it, but no one really uh, pays much attention to it other than sticking labels on objectives. But the thing about context is a change in context will change uh, your objectives. Doesn't matter how good your um, uh, management systems are, if the underlying context on which you've based those um, objectives changes, then the, the objective itself is going to change. So you need to monitor those contexts once you've identified them. And uh, the big thing for that is big data and standard predictive analytics. Um, <coughs> oh, sorry. The other thing was IoT. I'll skip over that because I'm going to run out of time. Um, uh, most people are aware of IoT, which is Basically, these days you can put sensors on anything and collect information about everything. More to the point, you can do a lot of that through visual. In fact, um, Telstra, uh, Telstra, Tesla has just changed its uh, um, autonomous vehicles to work purely off cameras. So cameras can now be fitted to all your different processes. And in risk, the big area will be um, on controls. So you can actually um, use cameras to actually uh, assess when controls are needed or how they operate. Um, but I'll skip over that for now. Uh, virtual and augmented reality, which is those weird goggles people use. Um, the big thing about that uh, outside of game playing is it gives you the ability to deploy subject matter expertise into remote locations. So the people who really have the strong knowledge of a, of a uh, uh, of a, a topic or a piece of equipment can actually um, uh, use a local operator who may know very little about the actual inner, inner workings of the piece of equipment to put on a virtual reality um, a headset and they can interact with that person telling them how to carry out, how to investigate, um, how to troubleshoot problems. Um, and maybe how not to have typos. 
Sorry about that. <coughs> um, the next major thing is nat natural language processing. The big part of that is text analytics. Now, text analytics gives you the ability for it to analyze documents as well as um, uh, videos, pictures, lots of different uh, media. And from that, uh, extract relevant information. The first thing about it is uh, from a compliance point of view, the idea is you upload all your um, uh, framework documents. It can actually pull them out and work out uh, how they relate to your risks or point how your risks relate to them, um, which gives you a number of different ways of looking at it if the standards change or um, uh, if you need to see what your compliance is on a, any specific area. Uh, <coughs> the other big area of natural language processing is the area of um, behavioral analysis. Um, again, I've got another talk uh, at, uh, uh, in another conference coming up on behavioral analysis. But one of the biggest uh, inputs to any risk management system is the uh, is individual behavior of, um, of your workforce. You need to monitor it and um, you need to check for stresses and obviously insider risks. Um, that can all be done through all the communication. So I'm talking about not only just the emails and letters and chat systems, but most um, uh, vo voice communications these days is over a digital network. Therefore, that, that information can be analyzed. And again, there's a whole range of privacy issues, which again, we can talk about, but a lot of those have actually been already addressed. Um, so following the right protocols, you can actually do uh, communication monitoring and get decent results out of it. The robotic uh, automation processes is a lot more than just automated workflows. It's the incorporation of AI into the workflow. And basically it's the way that you can operationalize all the things that we've been, talk I've been talking about so far. So the models you build, you can actually put into the, um, onto, uh, onto the shop floor or at the coalface. So to when people are actually carrying out their work, they can get the automatic assessments, um, vulnerabilities or risks can be highlighted at the time. It can pull in related information of what they're talking about. So it then gives the actual person working uh, on a job, the actual benefit of the risk management as opposed to reports and um, dashboards. Uh, blockchain is probably the one thing that I mentioned earlier on that um, you can't do off the top of your head today. It's there and obviously Bitcoin has shown it. Um, and the big part of that is actually what's referred to as smart contracts. So contract management, I believe, will disappear in the very near future. It will become automated. But um, the big thing about that, apart from eliminating fraud, which is obviously the big area for it, is um, managing the whole su supply chain risk area. Supply chain has changed to being close to being fully digital today due to COVID. Um, and it has a lot of different components from transport companies to shipping points to agents. Um, apart from your suppliers and customers. And all those allow in um, cyber threats, as well as give you multiple points of failure. By introducing blockchain um, into that process, you can actually strengthen and um, uh, hopefully prevent a lot of those failures occurring. And finally, based in decision-making. <coughs> this is where I was talking about before, we're talking about aiding or augmenting human decision-making. So all the pieces of information and the big problem we've got is complexity and I uh, see that other people are gonna be talking about. It. Complexity is the biggest problem that humans face today. Our world is so much more complex than it was even 10 years ago. Um, to actually put those different complexities together and try to work out how they're gonna affect the specific case you're looking at at the moment. Well, there is um, a technique, uh, which is the Bayes Bayesian uh, decision networks, that allow you to take multiple pieces of information and combine them together to come out with what the overall effect of those are gonna be. So that's it. Now, sorry, I'm running out of time. I know that, but just very quickly before I go, <coughs> I, <coughs> excuse me, 
AI has a, um, has a really poor track record. We've got it down there, 85% of AI projects fail. So why would you want to go into it? The reason of it is that most of those projects have been badly managed. First thing is that they're normally run as IT projects or um, prototypes or what you want to name it. Um, and therefore, they've really got no basis to what they're doing. It's people playing around with ideas. The key thing to for a, a AI project, and in this case, we're talking about risk management uh, application of AI, is it has to be line of business created and managed. You've got to start with the business unit and they've got to actually decide what they want to do with it and what they want to get out of it. And therefore, this is when these third-party tools like AutoML and cognitive services can come in. The second thing is it needs to uh, solve a real existing uh, problem, not some hypothetical um, change to uh, your processes. You, you, most businesses have a whole range of problems that they um, have trouble actually working out or managing. Pick one of those and make it work. Um, the third thing, really important, get the users involved. Big reason for AI systems failing is that they're rejected by the end people who are supposed to use them. Um, you get them involved from day one in both the um, development to calibrate those models and in the testing of them. Their involvement will then make them more inclined to actually pursue them when they actually get deployed. Um, like I'm saying, try to in involve subject matter expertise and not impose some mathematician or IT uh, point of view on how it should work. Um, and uh, yeah, the final one there is, uh, oh, not, yeah, be value adding, which I've already talked about. The final one there is make it measurable in terms of corporate outcomes. So work out what you're actually going to achieve by doing it and then measure it and um, you can report on it. So that's it. Um, oh, so that's it for me. Um, I'm happy to communicate with other people involved. Uh, that's my email address. Uh, you can get me through LinkedIn and my website uh, where you can get my book, obviously also on Amazon. <coughs> um, that covers me now. Sorry, I probably went way over time, um, but I did try to condense as much as possible. Sorry, Sarah. So that, that's absolutely fantastic, Gregory. You managed to take an entire book and distill it down um, into, into some very, very succinct points and a brilliant overview as to really some of the, well, I guess the diversity um, in terms of AI. Now we've got time for one question. There are other questions that are coming in on chat. So for example, Verena has a fabulous question that's in there that I'll push you to in a second, just um, online as it were, rather than verbally. But one question for you before we move to our next speaker. So Jane has asked, she says, fascinating way of thinking about real-time risk management. And um, what is your view on how risk managers will build trust in using these sort of techniques that perhaps aren't widely understood? What do you think? Well, that's what that last slide was predominantly about. Um, again, I believe you need to start with their problem and involve them in the actual um, uh, development of it. So again, move away from the traditional way of treating it as an IT project. Um, whether we're talking risk managers or line of business managers, um, both have specific issues that they have difficulty trying to grapple with. Uh, you choose one of those. If you're solving their problem, they're going to want you in the first place. Uh, second thing is they're involved in building that and um, adding into it. Because like I said, it takes subject matter expertise. Um, they will be more committed to getting it to um, work. Brilliant. No, thank you very much for that, Gregory. And uh, I just noticed there are some more questions that are beginning to come in on chat, etc. as well. But um, we need to move on. We need to go to India, from right. Australia to India now. So um, please, everybody, if you could put your hands together for the wonderful Gregory. Absolutely brilliant. Bossy goes and finds 